Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I have been asked to talk about what drew me to Islam, why I became a Muslim. And I realized that we have a room full of people who have also not been born Muslim. And so I will give you a little bit about my story and some comments. And then I'm hoping that other people will share their experiences. And perhaps some of the people who are born Muslims can also share their perceptions of these uh, weird Westerners who suddenly take up with Islam. A few years ago, um, I gave a talk um, in South Africa looking at um, converts to Islam of an earlier period. Um, there's been quite a lot of work done about uh, people who converted in the 1850s to 1950s um, in England and uh, what they went through. Um, now, looking at the reasons, particularly more latterly, uh, there were waves of movements through the 70s and 80s when uh, people more on the hippie trail, more counterculture, um, found something very attractive um, in the other, in another world. And often they were actually in revolt about the limitations um, of their own culture. What I've also found is that quite often um, the children of parents who worked in Muslim lands became Muslims. Um, I kind of fall, and my late brother also became a Muslim. We fell in, a bit into that category. We were born and lived our early childhood in Malaysia with a father who was really very sympathetic towards Islam, loved Malaya, loved its people, um, spoke Malay fluently, had to give judgments with the Qadis. And so, you know, he had some background. And although he later found a little difficult in accepting that we became Muslims, he did um, admit to me that uh, he had thought of becoming a Muslim himself. Um, but what my generation um, and the generations to come of converts um, benefited from is that we were not constrained by losing jobs, um, going without our, uh, you know, being imprisoned in a social thing. My father um, was in the last Malay cabinet. He was a professional colonial officer. He knew, as he told me, that if he became a Muslim, he would no longer be able to represent the British government. Um, there were many others who were secret Muslims. A couple of his brother officers um, did become Muslims. One didn't marry, one married a Malay girl. They were treated with great respect. And years later, when my father went back to Malaysia, he met with them. And he met with um, Tunku Abdul Rahman, who was Malaya's uh, first prime minister, who was thrilled that Noraji, my brother, and I had become Muslims. Um, and they met as friends. And one saw that he had had an attraction, but circumstances and a belief in his own background, a belief um, in the British Empire, although it was drawing to a close, um, didn't allow him to follow where there might have been an opening of the heart. And I had another surprise. I had a very fine godfather, my father's dear friend from university, who was of Irish extraction. And when I became a Muslim, Toby said to me, do you know my father was a Muslim? And I said, how come, Toby? He said he was out in India for years, spoke every dialect, was in some state in UP, and we really didn't know him. Um, Toby's sister was an Anglican nun. The family uh, were brought up um, between Ireland and England, and suddenly the father retired. He came back and saw his children again, who he really knew nothing about, and they knew nothing about him. And he announced to them, 
um, because by that time he'd retired. So he could say, I'm a Muslim. You know, I'm not representing the British government. And he embarrassed and annoyed them because he was constantly having um, arguments uh, with the local priest about <laughs> it. And I, I, I said to Toby, did he go to the mosque in Woking? Because that was where a whole collection of fairly educated, upmarket British Muslims gathered. They had their tea parties. The women certainly didn't wear hijab. I mean, any pictures I've seen, they were wearing garden party dresses. And they, you know, they, they did some more seriously than others. Some went on hajj. Um, and they grouped together. But with poor Toby's father, I, I said, yeah, okay, so he went to the mosque in Woking, so he was a Muslim. Did you bury him as a Muslim? No. And I think that, I mean, the research has shown that most of these British Muslims of the before 1950 areas, very few of their children actually stayed in Islam. It was just too difficult. And there was another difficulty of earlier years. You were entirely associated with the Turks and with the Ottoman Empire. And if you think World War I, um, there were very few Indian Muslims in England in the early years of the 20th century. Um, you know, they were either Maharaja's sons coming to visit Queen Victoria, um, or else uh, they were coming to read law at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, so the perception of the British about Islam was that it was a Turkish religion. And with um, World War I, and also with attempts to give, um, treat Turkey better in the years before World War I, um, they were immediately perceived as a fifth column and uh, had to hide their Islam or even change identities um, or take uh, a lot of opposition. At the same time, um, the Western converts today are more likely to be suspected of having terrorist um, affiliations um, than the people who are born Muslims. I mean, say, why? What are these? You know, what are these characters done? Um, you know, why have they become Muslims? And so there is always that question mark. Um, I think we are extremely lucky because we got Islam without a lot of cultural baggage or tribal affiliations. We didn't have the benefit of easy access to the Arabic language um, and that continuity. Most of us disturbed our parents greatly by making changes. Not everybody. I have come across Western Muslims who had an easier transition period. Um, at the end of my mother's life, I was talking to her doctor and explaining that a lot of her depression and anger came out of both my brother and me being Muslims. And he looked at me and he said, but I thought that was part of her mental problems. I thought it was a complete imaginary <laughs> you know, paranoia <laughs> of fragmentation. I mean, he was shocked, you know. I was a Muslim, huh? I mean, how, you know, how, how could this possibly have happened? If anybody asks me what really attracted me to Islam, I would say it was the Sharia. It was boundaries. I came from a very happy, liberal Christian family. My father and mother enjoyed people from all races. Um, there were lots of visitors. He continued connections with Malay and Chinese. I was born with a pair of chopsticks in my hands. It was in no way um, a repressive situation. Um, there was really nothing that much to complain about. So I didn't fall into the counter culture, didn't particularly want to upset anybody or particularly rebel. Um, I practiced uh, as a Christian, um, as a child. Um, and then when I was 14, I read Gore Vidal's novel, Julian. 
Now, Gore Vidal has been accused of many things. In my case, he really bashed my faith. Suddenly, I realized that Christmas and other things were all Mithraic cults. And this, to my 14-year-old mind, was deeply disturbing. I started to ask questions. Was uh, Christianity really a convenient um, weapon for the greater Roman Empire? Um, what was it about? Um, nobody seemed to have much interest in explaining to me about the Trinity. And that didn't make um, much sense. Um, I think I always had a romantic view that one day I was going to go back to Malaysia. You know, if you're uprooted from somewhere as a child, I spent a lot of time in English boarding school dreaming of beaches and palm trees and the smell of coriander and food and all of these things that had been um, taken. My brother was more Chinese oriented because he stayed with the servants, spoke fluent Cantonese and um, I think he perhaps dreamt of China, <laughs> I don't know. But we definitely thought there was a more exciting, interesting world out there than England in the 60s. Um, so there was that little bit of a romantic desire to affiliate yourself with a more exciting um, way of life. Also on my father's side, my family had lived and largely died in India for over 200 years. So tiger skins featured and um, there was an interest. And you come from Bangalore, my grandmother is buried there. Um, so there was a sense of tremendous interest in India and wanting to get there and to get to Malaysia. And I think a, 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 a slightly romantic association with Islam, which couldn't be exactly vocalized or to be seen as being something that would happen. Um, but I, you know, I was interested in what was happening in the Middle East. I was interested generally in getting as far away from Europe as possible. Uh, this is my first uh, visit this time to Denmark and my second to Sweden. And I had not um, actually been in this part of Sweden or to Stockholm before. And I thought to myself, I spent all my youth never wanting to see anything in Europe. I just wanted to go to Southeast Asia. And really, I missed a lot. It's rather nice. It's lovely. I mean, I, I couldn't. Uh, Spain was different. I like Spain. I like the idea of Spanish history, studied Spanish, Spanish culture. But the rest, I thought, you can keep it. You know, why if you can go to the East, why where everything seemed to be so exciting and so vibrant, would you stay in Northern Europe? Now, when I was working um, in New York, and I actually lived in um, Princeton, New Jersey, commuting into New York, I rented a house which was too big, and so I had to find other people to live in it to pay the rent. And I got this young architect who I'd been at school with his sister and his wife, and then I put an ad um, at the university uh, to rent it. Up comes um, somebody who was doing his PhD on a critique of Al Ghazali, uh, under Philip Hitty at Princeton. And he and his girlfriend um, moved in. And he had, of course, a very specialist library. He was a Protestant clergyman from the Midwest of America who um, lost his faith in Christianity and decided to study Arabic. He definitely had fallen in love with the Arabic language. To my, uh, he became later, I know through a mutual friend, Bruce Lawrence, um, uh, you know, a, a scholar of Arabic and an expert on decree and destiny, and I have never actually met him again. But I'm indebted to him for um, the books um, he allowed me to borrow on Islam. And I said to him once, Richard, have you ever met um, any American girl who became a Muslim? And he looked at me and he said, no, only the ones that married Iranians. <laughs> And, uh, 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 you know, the idea that anybody would have independently become, unless they were under the support of a man, was, was completely incomprehensible to him. Um, 
this is a bit of a sideline, but I did meet a couple of uh, nice blonde American girls who married Iranians and became rather better Muslims than them. This always ended up with trouble. They took um, to being very devout Muslims, and uh, we're not talking, of course, Ahmed, about you and Sophia. That's, uh, <laughs> these were purely Americans. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of didn't work. They had a romantic idea and, uh, and then started to actually get interested in the Dean. And I wrote to my parents, and I found the letter recently. Uh, my daughters, I think, have uh, always slightly suspected that I became a Muslim in order to marry their father. And I was able to show them this letter. It gave me a lot of satisfaction. There was a date on it. I was, I was 21 years old, and I was writing to my parents and saying that Although I did not think that I would become a Muslim, um, you know, she protests too much, mm. I nevertheless considered it was the only acceptable faith. And that if one did have to have a religion of any form, that definitely that was the one that got my vote. So I felt that, you know, I justified um, a, 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 an earlier thing. But to go back to what attracted me, what really attracted me was boundaries, and I think that attracts a lot of Westerners. We were able to do exactly what we wanted. There was a lack of clear Sharia. Christianity was like Sunday church, um, and it wasn't much discussed. When people talk about the Church of England being the conservative party at prayer, that's just about it. You went to church because you were expected to go to church and because other people, in, particularly in Scotland, which was the Episcopal Church of Scotland, um, uh, you know, you saw other people. My grandfather was an ex uh, a respected elder of the church. He couldn't possibly not have turned up for Sunday service, nor invited the canon to lunch afterwards, um, you know, to discuss things. Nothing too theological, though. It was just an expected part of behavior. And I didn't really find that very interesting. Between the romantic idea of the East and the fact that um, nobody was very convincing, they behaved well, they were ethical, um, but it was flat. And then being aware that it was all based on Mithraic cults and other things, <laughs> which had slightly sort of knocked me, um, I found the very simplicity of Islam attractive. I found the five times a day prayer and waiting on death attractive. I found that it gave a sense of security. It gave a sense that of each day there was a renewal. It helped with any fear of death. You sort of knew what you had to do. It restricted dietary laws, alcohol. Um, I never smoked, I never did drugs, I was quite dull. I did drink because that was the way we were. Everybody drank. And in fact, one of the things my parents disapproved of the most was the fact that I didn't drink when I became a Muslim. There was this idea that you couldn't really trust somebody who didn't have a drink. You have to realize that it's so deep. I mean, Sweden has an alcohol problem, um, but I mean, Scotland's is slightly, uh, probably <laughs> slightly better, <laughs> but, not, uh, but not much. You don't drink, what you do? You see, again, it wasn't until the 70s or 80s that models started drinking um, sparkling water, and it, it became, you know, and vegetarians. Another thing, I had a period of being a vegetarian before I became a Muslim. That really upset them. I mean, where are you going to sit down to a roast leg of a lamb? Oh, you know, you, you were nutrition when you're deficient. It was awful. It was mad. Um, I didn't know really about Sufis. I mean, I knew about Hafiz and Rumi, but I didn't really know anything about Sufis. My interest in the history of Sufism and in the Sufis came afterwards. It was really a sense of belonging in a way, uh, of belonging to a, a group, of realigning myself conveniently with uh, the clothes 
and the food and the culture that attracted me. Um, I don't think that's a, a, a good enough reason for becoming a Muslim, but this was all the kind of window dressing that helped feel that you were in the right place, in a sense. Um, I have to ask myself whether I would have been able to have had the courage um, to take the distress of my mother and um, my, you know, some of my relatives, um, because in the end, religious path is very much aligned to um, racial identity, and not a, and fidelity in my parents' case or my mother's case to your ancestors. My grandmother's first cousin was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, so my grandmother, weeping, would say, Michael will sort her out. I mean, you know, hopefully. He was also, incidentally, one of the best Christian theologians, Michael Ramsey, of the 20th century. Um, but there was something morally reprehensible about um, abandoning. You were supposed to be loyal to your history, to your family, and to uh, a way of being. To have friends on an international level and not to have a sense of color. My, my parents were violently anti-apartheid. My father refused to work in South Africa. He was offered a, a very high paying job because he so disapproved of apartheid and believed in the comparative multiculturalism of Malaysia. Um, so they were totally liberal, and a question of color and race on a social level didn't enter it. But the idea of marrying somebody from, an, and also polygamy, from another um, country and following a faith um, that was not linked to family graveyards was deeply, deeply distressing. And if I had not married Sheikh Fadlala, would I have been able to stick to Islam? Because I have seen very brave people um, manage without husbands or unsatisfactory ones and divorce, um, actually stick to Islam. But very, very hard. Because unless you have a group that takes you in, unless you have like-minded people in a community sense. It is going to be extremely, extremely difficult. And I think that is a problem that confronts in many ways women far more than um, uh, men. Um, so I'm extremely grateful to Sheikh Fatlala for putting up with me and um, giving me, in a sense, um, that level of shelter. And as one grew older and learnt a little bit more and more windows were open, um, particularly that of Sufism, one felt even more grateful and honoured. And I see Sheikh Fadlala so distressed by what he feels has happened in the Muslim world, of the sufferings of the Muslims, and of how their rulers failed to honor and rule correctly in the Islamic form. And on a humanitarian level, I, this is absolutely dreadful, but it does not hurt me in the same way, because I don't have that genetic inheritance. I see Islam as the final revelation, as the best way to live in this world in preparation for the next. I am totally liberal about people who choose to follow other faiths. I don't have a judgmental thing. And I came from a liberal uh, Protestant background. I don't believe in proselytizing. If somebody comes to me and asks about Islam, I will tell them my experiences. I won't try and convert them. You know, there are some converts who are incredibly gung-ho um, and uh, feel obliged to share all their experiences. And I'm afraid I'm not in that category. 
I think I got a little bit of the cream of Islam. I got a, a wonderful life. I got to enjoy things about different Muslim countries, of everything about their, of their culture, their literature, their history. Um, for me in South Africa, uh, the Indian Muslims have been hugely hospitable and lovely, um, but I'm not a victim as some of their women are. You know, they have to turn up for the weddings, they have to do this. They are imprisoned within culture, not necessarily within Islam. I can pick and choose. I can uh, enjoy their company as people, I can share with them, but they can't control me. So the advantages of being an insider, outsider. Now, the Arabs have always been quite bad about accepting converts when they tell them what to do or um, start um, doing tafsirs of Quran like Muhammad Asad, whatever. So, but you know what? If you're not really telling the Muslims, born Muslims, what to do, if you're not a person of much importance, I think the generosity and the welcome and the hospitality is great. And, and my experiences have really, really been positive ones. I only had one uh, and rather amusing thing. When my youngest son was about four and a half, I was asked to give uh, a talk about the importance of Islamic education for um, young children, um, you know, more at the Montessori type uh, age. And this was in London. And one woman, before I could barely start um, saying anything, looked at me and she said, are you doing this because you feel guilty about your forefathers in India? And this was, uh, this is actually the only time I've ever had a public attack. And um, I looked at her, and it was just too much. I said, no, a bunch of mediocre Brits um, came and ran over a bunch of people who were too stupid enough to deal with each other and present a united front. They never asked me to speak again. Um, but I, I would like to open the floor to um, other converts to Islam and perhaps uh, uh, tell of some of their experiences and what, uh, what attracted them. Are there, are there any volunteers? There are plenty of you guys there. I don't think I should be talking because I've said my story so many times and you've all heard it too. I think so. I much prefer some of the others. Well, yours is a rather more um, uh, elevated story. I mean, suddenly seeing somebody do wudu, I mean, it's a lovely story. <laughs> Does that mean you want me to tell it? I don't know if the people here all know it or not. Okay. I will give you the brief version, version, otherwise it will be muggy before we finish. Uh, yeah, I uh, also came into Islam at the age of 21. I had, strangely enough, growing up in Sweden, born in the 50s, being a teenager in the 70s with all that that entailed, having a, an interest in politics and in international affairs it is almost inconceivable, but nevertheless true, that I had never heard about Islam. Uh, I knew absolutely zero about Islam, partly because I was so actively dis disinterested in religion. And uh, I had, however, started to wonder about the meaning of life and what happens after death, etc. Everything that happens in the world, is there some kind of red thread to all that's happening, or is it just everything by coincidence and chance? And I had slowly started changing my life, but I was not looking for the answer to these questions in religion. But very suddenly, out of the blue, I met this man. I was sitting in my sister's house in the north of Sweden. She had a little farm together with her husband very old-fashioned lifestyle with 40 goats and milking them by hand and drawing water from the well, etc. And suddenly this man walks in the door with a big beard and an enormous turban on his head. And I am absolutely 
shocked. What is this? Did he come down from the heavens or, or come out of the underworld? It was just like the most unexpected thing that could ever happen. However, we started talking a little bit. It turned out he was Swedish, but he had obviously traveled the world. He accompanied me to my little cottage in the forest on top of a hill where I lived. And he started telling me about Islam. Or I think so. I don't even remember what he said. The only thing I remember was that after a few hours, and this was one of those very uh, light, brief, Swedish, northern Swedish summer nights, somewhere around midsummer 1980. I had to ask him, you have lived here, he was quite a bit older than me, you have lived here in this cold climate for so long, how come you have such a soft heart? I don't know why I got the impression he had a soft heart. It was not what he said, it was more his whole manner of being. How, not what he said, but how he was. So he said, well, I don't know if I can explain that to you, but maybe I can show you. And he stood up and without any hesitation called to the prayer, did the adhan. And then he stood up and performed the prayer right in front of me. And I was sitting there trying to watch him and he is praying in front of me because now he's showing me how to keep your heart soft in this harsh, cold climate. But it was so overawing and overpowering, I was compelled to lower my gaze. And as I was sitting there and he was doing his prayers and after the prayer he sat down to do some dhikr, it was as a ray of light coming into my heart from the heavens. There is only one God. Suddenly I just knew that there is only one God. After he finished his dhikr, he came up and sat opposite to me. We sat quiet, both of us, for a long time. Ten minutes or two hours, I have no idea. It was as, it was as if the existence of time had, had ceased. And it was like we were outside of time and space. After a long time, or what seemed to as a long time, he bent forward and he, he put his hand over my shoulder and he said, Muslim. And that was it, how he had come to know what had happened to my heart. He knows and Allah knows, I don't know. But the result was that the very same day he taught me the ablutions, he taught me the prayers, and I was to all intent and purpose a Muslim. So I can truly say that in the evening I had never heard about Islam, and the following morning I was a Muslim. That's my story. Now beat that. How about Sheikh Saadi? Necessary. Short? Oh, God. <laughs> it's hard to be short. <laughs> it's all like a Sufi story, you see. That's yeah, okay. This thing is sort of ticklish. Yeah, it's supposed to play with it. It's supposed to play with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. You could do it like this, you see. <laughs> Oh, well. Oh, I see. There we go. Test. I'll try to be brief because Natalia has heard this uh, the long version. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then we can move the mic to her but and it, then to Sophia. But it began <laughs> when I was born. No. <laughs> In some ways, it's true. <laughs> then it was life? No, no. I, my. Fa I, I like to say that my family had an inner life and an outer life, my birth family, because um, my father was one of the first chiropractors or alternative medicine practitioners in the Midwest, uh, in the state of Illinois, in the USA. And so when m myself and my two brothers, we were raised with this whole sort of holistic health sort of ethos and they very, my parents very quickly got into, they became involved with these early ecological movements in the U.S. that were centered around a woman by the name of Rachel Carson. If you've ever heard of her, mm -hmm. she wrote this book in the 1950s called Silent Spring, which was warning about the dangers of pesticides and how it was killing animals, birds, <coughs> things like this. and. And we grew up with this, where, you know, you would have um, these spraying trucks come down the street where, you grew, where we grew up, and my parents would call out, okay, windows, 
and we all knew time to cl close the windows because the government told you that these pesticides that they were spraying on everyone were all completely safe. Now, since then, of course, they were proven to cause cancer, but there were mass spraying. Spray, you know, why? As we discovered later, of course, to pay the chemical companies um, who were providing all these sprays, but it was for our own good. <laughs> so, and then the third part of our inner family life was, as I say, you know, my parents were not really interested in conventional religion, but they felt that we should have something, so they read us these Bible stories. Now, the children's Bible stories uh, are sort of retellings of the stories of the Bible for children, like a storyteller would tell. So, but for their own inner life, my parents were involved in this um, American psychic called Edgar Cayce, who was a in the, in the, again, in the 40s and the 50s, was what we would now call a channel. And he channeled holistic health re uh, remedies, medicines, uh, rediscovering you know, plants and uh, native, native plants that would be helpful for healing. Of course, my father was interested in all this. And then there was also this other channeled information. So this was our family religion, you could say. But in a small town in Illinois, a small, really like a village, this was way too crazy to tell people about. Entirely too over the top. So then we were trained to, the, that is my brothers and I, we, on the outside we were told to say that we were uh, Protestant Lutheran Christians uh, of the Missouri Synod sort. And although you don't know about this, this was quite a conservative branch of the Lutheran Church, which is, of course, very the state religion in Sweden, right? Well, in the US, they developed a sort of a fundamentalist style of Lutheranism, if you can imagine. It was not really very liberal. So my brothers and I, we went to these elementary schools, which trained you in this, along with math and science. And of course, we didn't get evolution. We got creation, creationism, and how to refute evolution as a as a theory. So our, we, had the, you know, we outwardly presented as Protestant conservative Christians. Inwardly, we had this whole other thing going on we couldn't talk to people about. And um, when, I've, you know, left, when, when I left home, basically, I was sort of like fed up with pretty much all of it, <laughs> at least the Christian part, because the training in the schools was quite rigorous. We had to memorize all of Luther's catechism by heart and then stand up and present it in church, when they would ask you a random question from Luther's catechism, you had to respond with exactly Luther's answer to this and the proof verse from the Bible where, that Luther used to prove his part of the theology. So it was very, it was a very, I now look back at it and I say it was a very good training for memory. So it was at least that, and of course I learned the Bible very well. At least the King James translation of the Bible. But be that as it may, when I finally went off to university, I just sort of like threw it all away. I mean, I felt that there was some really genuine, there was something there about Jesus. There was some genuine something there, but it was so covered over. You couldn't like get at it somehow. And I, I didn't really want to spend the time trying to get at it. Um, I tried, you know, re reading um, Kierkegaard. Do people know Kierkegaard? <coughs> Hopefully they do. Um, a Swedish Lutheran mystic who was an ex Danish. Danish, Danish mystic who was existentialist, and he tried to make sense of existential philosophy and Christianity at the same time. I tried to read Kierkegaard in translation. Um, didn't really get too much from him, I have to say. And so when I went off to university, I just got involved in, this was in the early 1970s, social causes, anti-war movement, uh, pro-ecology movement, which there was in the US in the late 60s, early 70s. And I sort of threw all of religion out. Um, I was majoring in German literature and English literature and uh, writing. I was aiming at becoming a, some sort of journalist or something like that. 
because my idea was that if you were a journalist at the time, you could tell people what was really going on in the world, you know, all the bad things going on, and then they would act correctly. This was our idea at the time. Uh, you would tell, give people the facts, they would act rightly. I took a religion course at one point just because I had to. Uh, it was part of the requirement at the time. And uh, my instructor was very interested in Islam, and he was very sympathetic to Islam. And so I read a number of books about Islam. We, I remember doing a paper on the Sufi poets, on Mevlana Rumi. It was in translation, of course, Hafiz. And that was certainly appealing. Uh, wonderful poets I had never heard of and very deep. I had some deep feeling of that. But when I graduated, I went right into journalism. And that was, you know, in the, this was in 1973. I went to work for, um, it was supposed to be an arts magazine in New York. <laughs> uh, but when I got there, the arts magazine had gone bankrupt. And the owner of the magazine decided that since he had already hired me for a year, I would work on his consumer protection magazine, which I had no interest in at all. <laughs> you know, so again, in the 1970s, this was the positive part was about it was that we were supposed to be protecting people from dangerous food and drugs and you know, dangerous products, things like that. So it wasn't about how to buy better. And so I did learn how to do research at the time, before the internet, you understand, where you actually had to go to a library and do research, or you had to go to government records and try to discover things that the politicians didn't want you to discover, or as we used to say, cultivate actual sources, where you would call people up and get them to tell you things that they didn't want to tell you. And there are techniques for doing this. Um, a few people still use it today. So I had sources that I cultivated in the government who would tell me things they weren't supposed to tell me as long as I didn't use their name and things like that. And, and I wrote, you know, I thought quite sensible articles for this publication. But my, my boss, who was the owner of the magazine, he said, uh, look, Neil, Neil was my Christian name or still is my Christian name. Um, these, are, this is, these are very good facts, but you're not making people afraid enough. You need to make them afraid more. Because when they're afraid, then they buy more of our magazines. You know, this was in 1973. So I start, and I started to consult with, you know, I, other young people in their 20s who were working in this field. They sort of told me the same. You know, I'm rising through journalism. If you can make it more sensational, make people more afraid. You know, then they buy more, then they give you more stories, and you do this, and that, and da, 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 da. So I said, no. You know, I, I went, I left commercial journalism. I went to work for what we called the underground uh, press in the U.S. at the time. We still had an alternative news media. And we still had this ethos, we'll tell people the truth, and they will act properly. We, we believe that. You know, tell them the actual facts and they will act accordingly. And then here's the story. I am getting around to it. Okay. <laughs> there was a poll. You know, they still do polls today. Mostly they're wrong <laughs> about elections, but those are nonsense. But th there was a poll and they asked a sampling of Americans, um, given that there's no solution to the disposal of nuclear waste is getting energy from nuclear power a sensible way to do things. We can't, we don't know what to do with the waste. You have to keep it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and it may pollute the earth and we don't know and you know could poison your children. You know, given all of this, is using nuclear energy a sensible way to get our power? And 70%, 7-0% of the American sample said, no, it's not sensible. This was in 1970, uh, still 1973, 1974. And then as they did in these polls, they asked other questions about their lifestyle and what they like to do and other questions, other areas. And then towards the end of the same poll, they asked people, okay, 
if you had to give up some of your lifestyle, some of your conveniences, some of these labor-saving devices, because we had to give up nuclear power, if you had to give up some of your comforts, would you be willing to give up these comforts? And the same 70% said, no, <laughs> we would not be willing to give them up. And you know, to my young mind, and I was 22 years old at the time, this was like, this is a tragedy, you know, if you can imagine. I'm spending 60, 70 hours a week with my colleagues, re my young colleagues, my young people, <laughs> researching these stories and getting stories and trying to put the word out. We had like 400 alternative newspapers in the United States at the time. And we were send sending stories to all of them, and they printed the stories. Um, we still had a free press. So, but you know, it's a tragedy because it, what it meant was that people did not act logically, as Sheikh Fadlala was saying. <laughs> um, there were a whole, people acted from a whole different set of presumptions or uh, other motivations, really. Uh, and it still remains true today, actually, uh, which is why I'm not in journalism, particularly. Um, and I, at the time, in my 20s, I had to look at it also personally, you know, do I act always logically in my life? Do I always have the information, all of the information, before I have to make a decision? Is that even possible? When I have to make a decision about, um, you know, what, who, who, I'm in who, who, I, who I'm in relationship with? Um, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> is that a logical decision? Seriously, um, are you know how how do why does my mind behave the way it does? And what about God and questions of death and why am I here anyway? You would say you know what's all this and so I had sort of midlife crisis in my early twenties, <laughs> my mid twenties actually. No, it was for the early 20s. And I began to look around for who knew about these things. And psychology was, I would say, nowhere in the 1970s, or at least seemed to be nowhere. Uh, uh, I, I looked into different sorts of meditation techniques where they told me to calm my mind and things like this. And I had a very active mind. I still have a very active mind. Calm, just calm your mind, this is sort of crazy. <laughs> you know, how do you stop you know, a running horse? Impossible. One needs a way, one needs an actual practice. Um, and eventually, I would say I ended up with Sufis. First an Egyptian Sufi, who really didn't do much more than roll around on the, on the floor and play his dumbek, and encourage us to do the same. <laughs> um, and he was sort of nonverbal. He was like totally nonverbal. <laughs> you know, weeks, weeks would go by, he would, wouldn't say anything. But I kept coming. And then once he would have us whirl around until we fell down, and that was that. Was that. And so then he left town. And I looked, Sufi, Sufis, who are the Sufis? You know, um, I, for some reason I, I wasn't attracted to Buddhism, I wasn't attracted to Hindu meditation. I researched in the library, who were the Sufis? Where could you find Sufis in the United States in the 1970s? So eventually I found some Sufis. Um, was the Sufi Sam? It was the, the people who were yeah. connected with Sufi Sam. And on the way to meet these people, I had a huge car wreck uh, in the car I was riding in, rolled over in the middle of the desert in the Great Salt Lake area in the middle of the night. And we all pulled ourselves out of the car and uh, rolled the car back over and kept driving somehow. Uh, we don't re I still don't understand how we did all this. And ended up in California uh, in 1976. And this is where I encountered basically uh, the path. And the fact that it had some body, you know, there were prayers, there was a practice, uh, there was a way this appeal to me. And it seemed to be broad enough that one could follow, you could say, one's inclination while still holding hand with someone and getting some authentic transmission. And, and for me, that was the, 
That was sort of the entrance to the path. And then it becomes deeper, you know, from that. Um, certainly there's a lot of superficiality that can go on uh, when one enters sort of what seems to be an eclectic path. But if there is a heart of a transmission there, uh, that, that heart of transmission, that genuineness will, you know, like sap through a vine, will force its way through. And um, as they say, the, the, the willing student, <laughs> the, the, one, the one who's willing to draw it out, uh, is, is the main thing. It's really the intention, the niya, is what does, what does the work. And then one finds one's way. And don't you think there is a sort of resonance? I mean, for people who just hear the Quran, and that, that impacts. And most people who become Muslims are lost in that. I would say so. I, there, there, I think that's a very, there, there, there's a very resonance. important. There's a resonance. There's a resonance in a it. A distinct resonance. You know, for me, there was such a strong resonance. And this, again, goes back to my upbringing that I was suspicious of what they told me about it. Mm -hmm. I was suspicious of the translations of the Arabic mm -hmm. that I was given. I thought, no, there's got to be more than that. Because I was raised hearing multiple languages in my childhood. I didn't tell you about that, <laughs> but I'll skip that part. Mm -hmm. So I, I grew up hearing Polish, Yiddish, German, and English all at the same time. Sorry, I know they... <laughs> so for me, learning another language <laughs> seemed, why not? Mm. So, um, and it was through the Sufis that I actually came back to, in some ways, the work that has that's been part of my life work, uh, at least a small gift I've been able to offer, in that um, I was given the diaries of one of our Sufi teachers to edit, who had already passed. This was Sufi Ahmed Murad, Sufi Sam. Uh, and he wrote that if there was to be a zikr, a zik with the attunement to Prophet Isa, Jesus, it would be some form of Jesus' prayer, that is, the Lord's Prayer, but in his native language. But he had not researched this himself, but he had an intuition that this would be a way to go to try to recover that authentic spirituality that Christians had sort of like gotten rid of. And at the time, I didn't know there were Aramaic Christians still in the world. Uh, later, I discovered that. Uh, and so I began to do this research into the Aramaic, uh, as well as Arabic at the same time. Now that's my story. <laughs> Sheikh Muslim, do you want, how, is there the time? Does anybody else perhaps want to? I think I would do this since our guest speaker is uh, going to be opening our Sheikh Sadiq and his. I would be a bit curious. Uh, uh, Hajj Mustafa? Mustafa? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want to go. <laughs> I'll take the challenge. Okay. Actually, I will sit over there next to Sheikh Muslim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Um, there's a couple of things that just popped out at me when I was listening to, um, to Munira Khanum and then to uh, Sheikh Saadi. Uh, there seemed to have been a wave, you know, in, in America. I, and also in, with Sheikh Muslim. I, I also became Muslim when I was 21, same as you. And I was also a child of the early 50s. I don't know how old you are, but I'm 65 years old. Maybe you're a bit younger than I am. But also, um, you became Muslim around the age, uh, yeah. and, or, or the year is 76, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. That's the year I became Muslim, in 1976. And I had that exposure also to uh, the Sufi uh, path at the time, which was through Murshid Sam Lewis, and people like Wali Ali and Iqbal and all of them, Benefsha and all those people that you know and we both know very uh, much. Um, I have actually a, quite a, 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 a long story, but I'm not going to tell that today. Hopefully I'll get the enthusiasm to finish my book about 
about uh, my embracing Islam and the different uh, influences that I had in my life, especially the meeting of the different awliya Allah that I've met throughout my uh, life in the last 40 years or so, or however it's been since we embraced Islam. But my, I would say that essentially um, mine was more like a magical mystery tour and still, be, still continues as a magical mystery tour. Um, and I mean that in the, in the, uh, in the most profound sense. Uh, when I was a very young, uh, I was born actually, my parents were Holocaust survivors. I came from a Jewish background. And I grew up in a very um, uh, traumatized and uh, neurotic sort of household where, you know, my, both my parents, their families, my grandparents were all killed, all my uncles, my aunts. We were refugees in, in New York living in a basement just off the boat, basically from Europe. And uh, I, so I grew up in that kind of an atmosphere. And so what that in transmitted to me was uh, instability and a sense of not knowing who I was. And it, I felt extremely uh, uh, anxious about my life. And when I grew, as I grew older as a teenager, um, this whole idea of the chosen people um, just didn't, didn't make sense to me. Um, I, I, I started meeting Christians and others, and I realized uh, I was the only one in my family at that time that sort of ventured out to meet other people. And I saw that other people had merit, you know. I mean, when the, in the household that I was brought, the idea of being chosen and being from an elite uh, uh, background, uh, you know, everyone else was considered strangers. You know, they called them goyim in, in, uh, in Yiddish. And, and so I, we kind of held to our own group, our own sort of ghettoized situation. And so, but I ventured out and... And I started meeting other people. And I remember it was the, 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 uh, a couple of profound turning points in my life were that I was uh, 13 years old. It was just right after my bar mitzvah. I, you know what a bar mitzvah is, I think. You know, it's a rite of passage where a boy becomes a man. Um, there was a young uh, man who was in the apartment building that we were living. He was sitting in a lotus position in the backyard of my house. I never seen anybody do anything like that. And he was sitting with his eyes closed. And I, I, I had my bar mitzvah that weekend and I, I walked up to him because I was curious and he was holding a, a, a flower in his hand. And here I am, 13 years old. And as soon as I approached him, he opened his eyes and it was a type of flower that, was, that grew in a spiral sort of way. And he held it to me and he said, he said, this is the mirror of the universe. He said, can you see yourself in it, right? Wow. Yeah. And it just blew my mind when he said, <laughs> you know, I just said, okay. <laughs> yeah. This person knows something that I don't know. And, but, but somehow I, it, 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 com it, was a, it compelled my being. And after that, I couldn't go back to being this little fat Jewish kid, you know, uh, grew up in New York with... Uh, this I view that of myself of being sort of as part of the. I now felt part of a greater, uh, uh, a greater humanity, you know, because I discovered that this something so special. So I started visiting him, and he was a student of the Maharishi Maheshi Yogi, and he was connected with uh, the uh, art artists of uh, Hollywood, <laughs> people like uh, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy. They were all kind of spiritual people who were followers of people like Krishnamurti and so on. And he brought they, they, me into this group of people. So I became the, basically the babysitter of the stars, you know, in Hollywood. So I literally was the babysitter for Leonard Nimoy's children and uh, Donald Sutherland and so on. But not that that was the, the issue. What it was is all these people were connected because they loved spirituality and they loved... Krishnamurti in particular. So when I turned 16, they brought me to, to meet uh, Krishnamurti. And uh, I, I was with the children at the time looking after them, but they brought me to the place where Krishnamurti was giving a, a talk. And I remember one of the children running into the audience and I had to go after him to get him. And then Krishnamurti was up on the stage and he, I listened to some of the things that he said, and it just brought me again, like a moment out of my 
contextual life out of my thought of who I was. As I was 16, but still that his being, his light, his presence, I started to develop this taste for, a set, uh, for uh, transcendence. It was some, a though, a taste started coming to me of people who knew something that I didn't know. And, that I, and I realized it's something I wanted to know. And I was becoming more and more disturbed that I didn't know that. So it, what was becoming, uh, creating, uh, in, created in me was a disturbance and a, a desire to, to know and want to know. And the considerations of death and why am I so unhappy and why am I so anxious and why do I fear death and why do I, uh, am I always afraid of everything? You know, I, I found myself, you know, in a, in, a, in a very disturbed condition. But I saw also at the same time that these people were not. They were at peace. They had something of a transcendence. So by the time uh, I reached the age of uh, 18, I'd already started looking at these different spiritual paths. And, and uh, I became exposed to people like uh, Baba Frijan. I don't know if you people have ever heard of him. Uh, Fra Franklin Jones, I think is his name. Is that right? He set up a shop in Los Angeles where he sat in the window in a big giant chair meditating. So everybody walked by and they used to just look at him. So my friends and I, we went by and just watched him, you know, <laughs> meditating. And we thought it was an interesting thing to do. And, and finally, you know, he would invite us in and then we'd all sit down and listen to him talk. And um, I, I, uh, Ramdas came, you know, to Los Angeles and to the Bay Area. And, and uh, uh, I think you know who Baba Ramdas is. Uh, he was an American. He was the one who worked with Timothy Leary on the LSD research at the University of somewhere, which I can't remember, maybe it was Stanford. And, you know, he came and he introduced people like Haridas Baba. So I, I became a, gu a guru seeker. You know, I started from, you know, all this looking f for people who can help me to understand why I am so disturbed and, and to find an answer to what I was looking for. And at, by the time I reached 18, I'd had met uh, all, all these personalities and, and it culminated really in, the, in, a, in a shattering experience for me with uh, Swami Muktananda. <coughs> when Swami Muktananda, when he, he came to the States, he came to visit Los Angeles first, the, these, this same group of uh, actors and celebrities brought him there and I met him that was asked to go to the airport to uh, uh, carry his baggage basically and you know, take him to the ashram and when I met him for the first time um, he I just for, instinctually I went for his feet right and I bowed down and I kissed his his feet and he hit me with a bouquet of uh, a peacock flowers uh, peacock feathers right and when he hit me with that I blacked out totally. I went into some sort of like, I didn't know who I was. I didn't remember my name. I, for several minutes, I, I didn't know where I was or who I was or anything. I couldn't articulate this. But something in that moment was very precious and very intense, scintillating. It, you know, it was another state of consciousness. Now, granted, I had experimented with several psychedelic drugs before that and so on. I had a background and a context of all of that. So, you know, that experience wasn't entirely new, for, new to me, but it was new in the sense that I wasn't on any drugs or anything like that. That was like this, uh, something that happened between two hearts. So by the uh, time I was 18, I uh, decided to go on a search. Um, and I really feel like I'm still, I'm still there. I'm still on this, uh, the, that searching path. But, but in, in, when I left, I left Los Angeles and traveled to stay at different communities around the United States where gurus had set up all over. And finally winding up in, uh, in San Francisco, or the Bay Area, where uh, we, there were so many in the, in the 1970s there was an amazing effulgence in America, particularly in California. You know very well, Sheikh Saadi. People like Kala Rinpoche, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche, Suzuki Roshi, you know, a Joe Miller in the San Francisco Golden Gate Park, you know, would be walking every Sunday. He'd have throngs of young people wanting to take wisdom and knowledge from him. 
I mean, you were there. You were, we used, you know, and Sheikh Kabir was there. We, I mean, we, there was this magnetic thing happening. You know, after the, the Vietnam War was raging, people were asked, questioning what was going on in the world. What, who was our role? We didn't want to fight. We got exposed to pacifism. We got exposed to communism. We got exposed to drugs, to everything. But it was all really a guiding, uh, overall arching guiding for many of us to find answers that we're looking for that were uh, based on deeper, deeper uh, questions or deeper uh, uh, issues that were in our hearts. So uh, I, I, was be I became living in San Francisco very eclectic. You know, I, like I believed in all religions but followed none. This was sort of my, this was my Sufi way. You know, I became, I thought that at that time, uh, my exposure to Sufism was something more about the essence, essence of the teaching, not necessarily the practice. Now, I missed out on some of the Sufi practices like that Sheikh Saadi was talking about. I was more interested in other things at the time, but but yet through that door of, the, of Sufism and the language of saying la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, saying Allahu Allah, these are all things which were in, drew, uh, a, a, I felt a synergy with them. I felt a, a kinship with them, a resonance with them. And uh, at one point, we, our household uh, became a commune, and I, I'll, I'm not going to go much further because it's quite a, long, but it became a commune, and we called it the Ishq community. Um, Ishq, you know, meaning love, you know, uh, but it was the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge, which was, yeah, and we, it was an, a, an eclectic group of people of Buddhists, Sufis, Hindus, uh, um, all together Tibetan, uh, living in a, in, a, in, a, in a complex in Berkeley, California, and that's where I stayed until one day, um, uh, I was walking down the street, and it's amazing how everything that we do in life is connected. I mean, if anything that you glean from these stories is, is that every detail that you hear, it is a, a interconnected matrix of Allah's living guidance, individualized to every single person and to the whole of humanity. It's an amazing thing. Nothing is out of place. Not one atom, not one experience, not one word in existence is, without, is not without Allah's seal and niyat to be known in it. So when you hear all these things, keep that in your mind. So I was walking down the street and uh, I saw a woman uh, who was uh, crying on the street and she had all her restaurant equipment on the street. And, she's, and I, I sat down next to her and I said, what, why are you crying? And she said, I'm going bankrupt. My restaurant doesn't work and I can't afford to do anything anymore with it. So I just had this inspiration. I said, I, in those days you could do things like this. I just said, why don't you give me your restaurant? And uh, I, in three months, I'll pay you double what you're asking for any of this, right? I had no idea how to run a restaurant. I, you know, I was living in a commune, so I was cooking for 40 people. I figured, what could be the, you know, what could be the deal? I could do it, right? So I, she, and she just said, okay, you know, and that was like Berkeley in 1972, 71. And uh, she gave me the restaurant. And I brought all the, my members of my, of my commune, which were about 40 or 45 people. And within three days, we had completely redid the whole thing, painted it, renamed it, st created a menu. Uh, and we opened up the first uh, fast food, uh, health food restaurant in Berkeley, California in 1970, I think it was 72. So as soon as I opened the door, it was a total success. I mean, people were coming in, lining up. You know, we were able to give them avocado and sprouts uh, sandwich with a glass of carrot juice for $1.50 within five minutes, you know, and they were happy. And it, it sort of went along with the time and it was the beginning of the health food movement and all that. Okay, so one day, this man appears in front of my door, right? And he was wearing a gray robe, a green turban, a staff with a kashkur. Do you know what a kashkur is? It's a, it's a gourd mm -hmm. that they, the, the Sufis of uh, Iran and uh, Azerbaijan and other places, they carried on a chain 
over their shoulder. And they, it, it's like what they collect the, that day for food and things to eat and so on. And there he was, standing in front of my door. And he yells into my restaurant. He says, he says who will feed a man of Allah today? Right? And I'm looking at him. <laughs> and I'm going, this is Berkeley. You have to understand. And I looked at him and I said, OK, uh, come on in, right? And he comes in and he said, I am a man of Allah. I said, I had no idea what he's talking about. I mean, I kind of knew Allah, with God, and, but he was all dressed up in this outfit. And, and so I sat him down at my table and I just instantly loved this man. And he, he gave me his name. His name was Sayyid Jamarani. He was from a family in Iran. Um, and he said that he was a dervish traveling around the world. And he said he had no money and nothing. He was only relying on Allah to give him what he uh, was looking for. So I invited him to come and sit down in my restaurant. And he sat and he had breakfast. And then later on he had lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had dinner. And then I figured, well, you know, when's he going to leave? And uh, he literally, as I was cleaning the floor and getting ready to leave, close up the restaurant, he stood up in a, on a chair in my restaurant. There was, there was nobody there but me. He stood up in a chair. He said, where will a man of Allah sleep tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was hooked. I said, OK, come on, right? So I brought him to my house. Anyway, he turned out to, I brought him to my house, and I introduced him to the rest of my family, to the people that I was living with, who were essentially my family. And, we had a sunroom, which we use as a meditation room. And we moved him in there. And he wound up staying with us for the better part of a year. Right? <laughs> he was, and he never came out of, our heart, out of the sunroom. He stayed in the sunroom. We would bring food. You know, I would bring food. And every time I'd come in to see him, he would open up a book of Hafiz right? or something or Quran. And he would read it to me. And he would say something to me. And every time I would try to go to my restaurant, he wouldn't let me leave the door, out the door, unless he opened Hafiz first. And it was, if it came out positive, I could leave. If it was negative, I couldn't leave. He wouldn't let me leave. You know, it was like having my own little Sufi gnome living in my <laughs> kind of an oracle. You know, my own little, and he was a little guy too. And you know, it was, it was wonderful. It, you know, and he const and he constantly was influencing me to and the teaching me about Islam and about Sufism. But I still was thick. I did, wasn't getting it. It was still this, you know, it was in a f slightly foggy for me, the, my relationship with him. I, li I loved him. I'm, I'm glad he was there. And I was learning from him. But I just yet was not ready to move into that uh, uh, space in which I would become a Muslim. So one day after that, um, he came out of his room, maybe six or seven months later, eight months later, whatever it was, and he said, he said, how will a man of Allah return to his country? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a, I was done by that point. Said, you know, so I, I, took him, I bought him a ticket <laughs> to Iran, and... Uh, and I took him to the airport, and the day that I took him to the airport, he gave me two gifts. He gave me a flat, a, a, a cloth that had written the name of Allah on it, uh, Jalla al Jalal. Mm -hmm. And he'd given me a ring, not this one, but he'd given me a ring that had the Panjatan, or the five, the members of the Prophet's family, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet's name. He said, he said, wear these two, and he said, everything will be fine. So I put the ring on, and I took the flag, and I brought it to my restaurant, and I put it above my cash register. Right. When I put the flag above my cash register, it was that was the beginning of a complete turn. At that point, I was I had to make a, I was working also uh, as a uh, uh, on a project called the, the Tibetan Aid Project. With, there was a Lama in Berkeley. His name was Tarthang Tulka Rinpoche. He's head of the Ning Mapa School of Tibetan Buddhism. And so I was working there. And uh, I want to tell you this part because it, it feeds into the second part, the first part, uh, rather, that I was telling you. 
Um, one day, a group of really long-haired, very fine-looking men, which actually a lot of you met young men here reminded me of these people, uh, came, and they were all students of Sheikh Abdul They had come to publish a book called The Way of Muhammad. I don't know if anybody, mm -hmm. anybody here has read it, but it's mm -hmm. a really seminal work. It's a work that came from the heart of Sheikh Abu Qadr during a time in which he was, he just had been, uh, he was a Muslim for some years and all this, that spiritual knowledge was pouring out of him in such a, a way that it really addressed the hearts of the young people at that time. So he was, ha so people, there was a man by the name of Abd um, uh, Hajj, uh, Abdul Aziz Redpath and Abdul Jami and a few other people that we, some of us know. Abdul Haq, presumably. Abdul Haq also, but mm -hmm. I didn't meet him at that time. Uh, Abdullah Luongo was there mm. and uh, others. But when this book was printed, it was printed at Dharma Press, where I was working, mm. it was called The Way of Muhammad. And all the books that were printed were always stacked up near my office. So uh, I put one of them off and I, and I started to read The Way of Muhammad. I couldn't put it down. I was reading my life. I knew that this was my path. I knew that all the things that Sayyid Jamarani had told me had now come back to me. Everything that he was saying to me was now unfolding in a very you know, a compelling way, a mirroring way. It just was drawing me out. And when I said, when I said that, uh, or when I read that, and it compelled me in such a, a, a powerful way, mm -hmm. the Lama came down, and he looked at me reading the book. And, and, I, and he, said, he said, don't read that book. You know, he, he's a very cultural Tibetan. He said, he said, he said the Muslims have nothing to say, right? I just read this book, it was like my life. It was like, my, I just read my heart. Mm. And I, I said, and I was afraid to disagree with him because he was my teacher. Mm. He was my meditation teacher and I relied on him on taking advice. Anyway, he, he got so angry with me for disagreeing with me, he threw me out. Mm. Right. He said, get out, get out in the street. And when I went out onto the street, I was in tears. And these guys who had been, uh, Abdullah Redpath and these other brothers who were out there, loading their truck with the books that, that, that were just printed, they saw me, or Abdullah Redpath saw me, crying. And he comes up to me, and I said, Salam, right, because I knew that they were Muslim. And then he grabbed me, he said, and he punched me in the chest and said, you're a Muslim, right? And he started punching me. I mean, I don't know if you know, you know Abdullah Redpath. To understand that Abdullah Aziz, yes. sorry, uh, Abdul Aziz, Abdullah is his son. Yeah. Yeah. He started punching mm -hmm. me in the chest and saying, you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim. And, 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 I, and I was going, maybe I am. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> he said, come with us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, he, sw he swooshed me off into a van. <laughs> he swooped me off into a van and we went to a place somewhere in Berkeley, California and I entered into an incredible atmosphere you know, where men and women were, were all li living in this kind of community of Sufis with such courtesy, with beautiful incense burning, with beautiful things on the walls, with, with edeb between people, everyone pointed you know, their hearts, it's scintillating with dhikr. And I walked right into a dhikr in which the diwan of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ahlubi was being sung. Mm. And I entered into this garden of, of light and everything. And I'm going to cut through a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, a lot of things happened, five, six weeks I spent with them. But the time came, he said, well, you're going to become a Muslim or not? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to. I, I still hung on to this idea that all paths were the same, mm -hmm. that I just couldn't commit myself to one particular thing, that I believed in them all, to practice none, and that's really where it was. But, and it was, still was confusing to me, so I said, no, I won't become a Muslim. So um, they leave, they go back to England, I'm now in my restaurant, and I've had it now for two, three uh, years. After two, three years, a group of these same people of, of, of Sheikh Abu Qadr's were walking by my restaurant, and they saw the name of Allah written on my cash register, mm -hmm. over my cash register, and they walked in my restaurant. And at that point, they walked in and said, how come you have the name of Allah written in your, on your cash register, up above your cash And I explained to them what it was, and I realized they were the, some of the same people that I had met some years before. And they said, you know, you really shouldn't have that name. You're not purified. You know, they gave me a little bit of, they were zealous. 
because you can't touch it, you know, and all this. You're, you're not, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, you need to come and learn about this. And they took me to a, uh, a wedding in which I attended in Monterey, California. And again, some of the same people who we knew were all there, and they remembered me, and they welcomed me. And I still was holding back. I still, I loved the whole thing, but I just didn't want to be a Muslim. Anyway, that night, um, I went back home, and I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, uh, I couldn't sleep, and something overtook me. And you know, they talk about sort of the, the dark night of the soul, sort of a thing. You know, I, I it was that for me. I, I, I realized all the things I was looking at in my life, my, my restaurant, this commune, this, my life, and all of a sudden, the, the the glitter of it, the, the <coughs> everything I believed just it was disintegrating in my, in my, in, in within me, and I saw that nothing meant anything to me anymore, nothing. But what meant, but what was echoing in me was what I experienced with these people: the heartfulness, the vicar kept coming to me, the prayer kept coming to me, the Quran, hearing the Quran kept coming to me, and I felt and I heard within my being this this voice that said, come. And that was it. And that morning, I, when the sun rose, I got in my car, and I just threw a couple of clothes in it, and I rushed down to uh, Monterey, California. And I, I just said, I don't know, really know what Islam is. I don't know anything. But I know what I sense and I see with you, what you all carry in your hearts. I feel it. I sense it. I recognize it, I acknowledge it, you know, and I said, what do I have to do to become one of you? And, and that was it, and I did my, uh, I did a ghusl, uh, and washed away everything from the, the niyat of washing everything away from the past, and uh, I sat in a circle, uh, and uh, there were two other young people there who had just said shahada. One of them was Hamza Yusuf, I think you know who he is. He was there. I was there, and we said our shahada all together, and uh, we embraced uh, embraced Islam. And from then on, it's been <laughs> the same thing. You know, just the most incredible. Uh, uh, one thing I remember, Shah Bukhara told me, he said, "If you become a Muslim, I can promise you one thing." He said, "You'll have a good time." Well, Allah, he's kept his promise. <laughs> Maybe there's more to it, inshallah, but. but <laughs> Wrap it up. Um, I think all I can do is express my gratitude for having had the opportunity to enter the path of Islam and for all the wonderful experiences. And also I'd like to leave you with a little bit about um, Sufis uh, of centuries ago um, who still continued up until present time in different forms, the Malamatis, and how they chose to believe. They did not allow for any conspicuous dress to identify them from the rest of the population. They tried not to increase their ego by talking about all their spiritual practices. They respected their neighbors of other faiths. And I think that in a way for Muslims today and with the world that we are living in, those ideas of being on good terms with the people around you, of not making conspicuous demonstrations of piety, and above all, working on your inner. Because it is a time of need for inner jihad. We've seen what messed up outer jihad has done of the harm to innocent old people, women, children, non-combatants. And it's, I think, very important to realize that Islam should be used as a tool and as a mercy for all the worlds, not purely for the people who are born Muslims. Um, they have the advantage in some ways, hugely, but also it is a way for all of us to come to 
and to take the teachings in a way that enables us to live well and in harmony with all the people around us. Salam alaikum.